Hello and welcome to this video. So in this video, what we are going to talk about is to talk about the Monte Carlo method. So the Monte Carlo method is a pretty general method that can be used to calculate the thermodynamical properties of for example, systems of atoms or other types of systems. So in the previous lecture, what we saw is if you have um, a system of atoms, for example, where you have a box and each atom you have a given number of atoms and each atom has a given position x, y and z. Then a useful concept to describe the, um, the energy of those uh, system of atoms is to describe it in terms of their energy landscape. In the sense that um, if you try to describe uh, all the possible state of the system, depending on where the atoms are, Depending on where the atoms are, depending on the configuration of the system, it can have a different energy. So one way of looking at this is to plot the energy landscape, just like the energy that um, uh, a ball would have as a function of its altitude. It's exactly the same thing here. Depending on where the atoms are, depending on the, the configuration, depending on where all the atoms uh, are located, then your system would have a given energy. And what we saw during the, the last lecture is uh, some minimization method, starting from a given configuration where the atoms are at a given position. The, what, what the minimization method, what the energy minimization method is to uh, bring you towards the minimum of energy. So we saw different methods. We saw the steepest descent. We saw the conjugate gradient method. The goal of this method is just to move the atoms until you reach a minimum of energy. So this is useful if you want to look at what is the most stable energy, but there are some, uh, some limitations with this method. The first limitation is that, for example, if you use uh, the, the, steepest grade, uh, the steepest gradient method, if you start from this point, for example, and if you start to um, go downhill, in order to, um, to minimize the energy of the system, then you will be stuck in this uh, local minimum. You won't be able to find the real global minimum, the real position of the atoms that minimizes the total energy of the system. So the, the main drawback of this uh, conjugate gradient method or this steepest descent method is that you can easily get stuck into some local minimum if you don't start from the, uh, a position that is directly next to the um, global minimum. So the, the problem with this method is that it's very sensitive to uh, the starting point, to the, to the initial configuration of the atoms. And if you don't start from a configuration that is already close to the global minimum, then you are likely to get stuck into some uh, local minima. So one possible way to avoid uh, getting stuck or, or to, to maximize your chance to find the, the real global minimum is to start by a lot of uh, different initial uh, position for the atom. So if you uh, try enough time, theoretically, in most of the time, you will be stuck into some uh, local minima. But if you try enough times, at some point, you will be able to, to find the, the real global minimum. But usually you can never be sure whether you have found the real global minimum or if there could be another possible configuration that is even uh, lower energy. The second problem uh, associated to those uh, energy minimization methods is that even if you are able to find uh, the real global minimum, uh, all that those methods are going to give you is only what is the state, what is the energy of uh, those atoms at this global minimum. But that's usually not enough to really characterize um, the, all the, the, the thermodynamical properties of a given system, because if you have a system that is not isolated uh, from the rest of the universe, if it's a system that has a given temperature, then because of the temperature, the atoms are going to be moving and if the atoms are moving, it means that the system will be exploring a uh, different configuration in the very same way that um, if you had a, a mechanical energy landscape and if you had a ball uh, being placed here, and then if you are trying to, uh, to, if you provide some kinetic energy to this ball, 
it's going to be able to um, to oscillate between uh, different position based on how much kinetic energy it has. It's the very same thing for a system made of atoms. It's going to be able to explore different configuration based on what's the temperature, based on how much kinetic energy the system has and based on what's the ability for the atoms to move and to jump over energy barriers. So in this case, if you have a given temperature for your system, then the, the system will not just be staying at one configuration, it will be exploring different configuration, but not necessarily with the same probability. And if you want to know what's the average state of a system, what's the average pressure, what's the average temperature, what's the average uh, energy, then you need to explore all those configurations that can be accessed uh, by the system for this given temperature. And this is not going to be, uh, you are not going to be able to do this by the conventional energy minimization method. So that's one thing that the Monte Carlo method can do. That's the, exactly what the Monte Carlo method is good at, is to explore very efficiently all the possible configuration that are accessible to a given system at a given temperature. And this way, what you can do is to calculate the average values of the thermodynamical properties that characterize your system. The average temperature, the average pressure, the average energy, the average volume, etc. So first, what we are going to do is to briefly explain what are the basic idea of uh, the Monte Carlo algorithm. It's a very general method that can be applied to many things including problems that are not related to simulating the motion of atoms. It can be used, for example, to calculate the values of integral or to simulate other kind of uh, physical systems. So it's a very general method and it relies mostly on generating random numbers. That's where the, the name comes from. The name Monte Carlo comes from this uh, city Monte Carlo in Europe, which is mostly filled by, uh, by casinos, so where random plays a big role uh, when there's a lot of gambling. So that's where um, the, the name of this Monte Carlo method comes from. And the main ingredient of this method is to rely on randomness, to rely on random numbers. So let's take a first example of what the Monte Carlo method can be used at. And what we are going to do first is to illustrate one use of the Monte Carlo method, which is to be able to calculate the values of integrals. And actually, as we will see later, the ability of uh, the Monte Carlo uh, method to calculate the values of complex integral is exactly what we are going to use. That's going to be the main advantage of the Monte Carlo method uh, to, to simulate the motion of atoms at a given temperature. So uh, let's take this example first. So let's assume that we want to calculate the value of the integral of logarithm of x between uh, 1 and 4. So let's assume that we want to calculate this thing. So of course, in this case, it's a simple integral, so it can be calculated analytically. You can calculate the integral of logarithm of x and take this between uh, 1 and 4. Uh, but in the, in the case of more complicated integrals, either because the, the formula is more complicated, either because the dimension is higher, here it's just a one-dimensional integral, but uh, if, you had, um, if you were integrating over several dimensions, that would be more complex and possibly you would have no uh, analytical solution to this, to this integral. So let's check, just check first this simple integral and just take it as an example, although again, we could have solved this uh, analytically. So one idea about um, using the uh, Monte Carlo method to solve the value of this integral is to, to rely on the following idea. So what we are going to do first is to plot the value of this function. So here we are considering the, the function logarithm of, of x. So we, uh, what we are going to do first is to plot this function and we want to calculate the, the value of the integral between x equal 1 and x equal 4. So the first thing is to plot the value of logarithm of x between 1 and 4. So when logarithm, uh, when x is equal to 1, its logarithm is equal to 0. And when uh, x equal to 4, log, uh, the, the value of the function will be equal to log of 4. So we can uh, plot what this function would look like. So it's equal to 0 uh, when x equal to 1. And for when x equal to 4, it would be equal to logarithm of 4. 
So now the main idea is that if we want to calculate um, the value of this integral, one way we can do that is to rely on the Monte Carlo method, which again relies on uh, randomness, relies on generating random numbers. So here the main idea is that first we are going to define a rectangle that contains the, the, the integral that we are going to, to try to calculate. As a reminder, uh, the integral of logarithm of x between 1 and 4, the integral of this function is equal to the area uh, under the curve. So the area of this uh, shape is exactly what we are trying to calculate. One way that you can calculate this area is first to define a rectangle that contains this area. So for example, there is different option, but here we could define this rectangle, which has, we has uh, an edge that is equal to 3 here, and here the height of this rectangle is equal to logarithm of 4, which, which is easy to calculate. And then what we can do to calculate the area of exactly this shape here, which is the, uh, the integral that we are going to try to calculate, what you can do is as follows. What you can do is to start generating some random numbers that, um, that will be inside this, this rectangle. So what you can do first is to generate uh, a random number x that is in between uh, 1 and 4. So that's going to give you uh, a value between 1 and 4. Then you generate a random number y that is going to be between uh, 0 and uh, log of 4. So this one is going to give you uh, a number here between 0 and 1 and 4. And this defines you um, a point M that has the, the, um, the, the position that is given by the random numbers X and Y. So then what you're going to do is to generate more and more random numbers. So you generate new values of X, new values of Y, and you try generating uh, a lot of random numbers. And by definition, since all the x values are between 1 and 4, and all the y values are between 0 and log of 4, all the random numbers that you are generating will necessarily be within uh, this rectangle. So now all you have to do if you want to um, calculate the uh, area of the integral, what you can look at is first you know the area of the, the rectangle, it's easy to calculate, and if you want to calculate what is the fraction that is occupied by this area here, what you can do is look at what is the fraction of the points, that the random points that you have uh, added, that belong to this surface. You look at uh, among all the random points that you have generated within these rectangles, what are the ones that are located here under this area? The fraction of those points are the points that belongs to this surface here. So that's the point that belong to the uh, integral that we are going to try to calculate. So if we summarize, the, the way we can uh, calculate this integral here is to say that first, this integral is going to be equal to the area of this rectangle here. So the area of the rectangle is the, 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 the multiplication of the two edges, so 3 times the, the log of 4. This is the um, area of the, the rectangle. And we know that uh, this uh, integral here is only a fraction of this uh, area of the rectangle, and the fraction is equal to the number of points that belong to this area divided by the total number of points that you generated. So this is, uh, if we want to calculate the, the area of this, um, of this curve, the integral, we take the, um, the value of the area of the rectangle and we multiply it by the fraction of this area, the fraction that this area is occupying with respect to the total area of the rectangle, and the fraction of this area is the fraction of the points that belong to this area. So we multiply it by the number of points that belongs to the, the integral, that, and we divide it by the total number of points that we generated. So how do we know for a given point if it belongs to this integral or not? It's very easy. 
the condition is that if you have a given point, if you want to check whether it is um, that whether it belongs to the uh, this integral or not, it belongs to this integral if it's below this function log of log, log, of, log of x, and if it's on top of this curve here, then it doesn't belong to the integral. So the way you can check this, the condition for point m to uh, belong to um, to the integral is to just check whether it's uh, uh, on top or below the curve log of, log of x. So the condition is if it belongs to the integral, then the y values must be uh, for a given x lower than its logarithm. You look at for a given x, you calculate the, the logarithm of x that gives you the, the, the value of the curve at this point. If the point is on top of that, that is to say, if the value of y is higher than the log of x, then the point does not belong uh, to the uh, integral. And if the point here is below this curve, then it belongs to the, the integral. So at the end, if uh, you look at this function, you take the area of the rectangle, you multiply by the number of points that are within the integral here, that are below this curve, and if you divide by the total number of points that you generated, this gives you the fraction of the points that are below this curve, and again, if uh, you, you take the area of this entire rectangle and multiply by the fraction of this area, then you get directly this area here, which is exactly the integral that we are going to try to, to calculate. So this method uh, will give you, if you try, if you generate enough random numbers, this method will give you a very good approximation of the value of this integral. And again, it relies on two key ingredients, which are the key ingredients of the Monte Carlo method. First, it relies on generating random numbers. And then it relies on checking whether the point satisfy a given condition or not. Does the point that you generated satisfy this condition? Is it below the curve that we are going to try to, to integrate or not? So if the, the y value is below log of, uh, log of x, then this point belongs to the integral, it should be counted. If the point um, y is such that y is larger than log of x, then it, be, it means that the point is, does not belong to this integral and then it should not be counted. So that's the main idea of the Monte Carlo algorithm. Generate random numbers, then check whether a given condition is satisfied or not. If yes, count this number. If not, doesn't count this number. That's the key ingredient of the Monte Carlo algorithm. So in practice, this is how it looks. So you um, plot this function log of, log of, log of x you uh, define uh, a rectangle that contains the um, area here of the, um, the, the curve that you are going to try to, to calculate the, the integral of. Then you generate uh, a lot of uh, random numbers, etc. So, and then you calculate the fraction of the points that are below these curves, which is used uh, then to calculate the area of the integral. Then if you look at what is the, the value that the Monte Carlo algorithm tells you, so this is the value that is given, the value of the integral, and this is plotted as a function of the, num the log of the number of uh, random points that you are generating. You see that initially, if you generate like very few um, points, you have a pretty high uncertainty on the value of the integral that, that you um, that you are trying to calculate. Why? Because you are generating not enough points, so you have a, you cannot be sure that the fraction of the points that uh, you found to belong to this curve is really representative of really the fraction of this curve or the fraction of this integral. But as you keep increasing the number of uh, points, the number of random points that you are generating, then uh, you get a value that is much more accurate and that belongs uh, that becomes very close to the, the real value of this integral. So again, the, this Monte Carlo method is pretty efficient because all you need to know when you want to calculate this uh, integral of log of x, all you need to know is to be able to calculate the value of this integral. To just check uh, if you generate a given x, you need to check whether 
um, the given y will belong to the integral or not. So all you need to do is to just uh, check uh, if y is larger or lower than the value of log of x. So it means that you need to be able to calculate the value of this function. But if you are able to calculate the value of this function, then you are able to uh, very easily calculate the value of its integral, assuming that you generate enough random numbers to achieve some level of uh, convergence. So that's a very um, efficient method, and that's the main idea of the Monte Carlo method that we are going to use to, uh, able, to be able to simulate the, and to calculate the average properties of uh, systems of atoms. So in general, when it comes to system of atoms, uh, wherein each atom has a, a given position and can move over time, what the Monte Carlo method will be very useful to is to calculate the average uh, thermodynamical properties of this system, to calculate its average energy, its average pressure, its average volume, etc. What the Monte Carlo method will not give you is the actual motion of the atoms or its actual uh, displacement of the atoms according to time. Why? Because again, this um, uh, Monte Carlo method will rely on random numbers. It will rely on a random moves. So the atoms will be moving randomly. They will not be moving like the way they would in real life. So this Monte Carlo method can, is very uh, efficient to explore all the possible configuration of a given system and to give you the average value of uh, certain thermodynamical properties that characterize this, uh, this given system. But it will not simulate the real motion of the atoms as they would occur according to time. If this is what you want, if you want to, to really see how the, the atoms are moving according to time, then you will need to use molecular dynamics simulation, not Monte Carlo. But Monte Carlo is uh, first more general than uh, molecular dynamics and also can be potentially more efficient to, to explore all the possible configuration of a given system in a more efficient way than uh, molecular dynamics simulations. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is how we can use the Monte Carlo method to calculate the average of thermodynamical properties. For example, if we want to calculate the average energy or the average pressure of a given system, how can you do that? So the first thing is that this, uh, the average of uh, properties depends on the thermodynamical ensemble that you are working on, whether you are working at constant temperature, at constant energy, at constant volume, at constant pressure, etc. So this is what we are going to talk about first. It's about the, the notion of thermodynamical ensemble. So the first thing to keep in mind is what's the difference between an intensive and an extensive thermodynamical properties? So as a reminder, the difference between those two types of properties is as follows. So let's assume that you have um, a given system, a given potato like this, and let's assume that this uh, potato can be divided into uh, two different slices. So part number one of the potato and part number two of the potato. So uh, then after that, um, if you, uh, you want to know whether a given thermodynamical property is intensive of, or extensive, what you need to look at is if you have a given property X, this property can be the temperature, the pressure, etc. What is the total, uh, the, the property for the total system? How does it relate to the property of system one and the property of system two? If you can write that uh, the property of the total system is equal to this property for uh, system one plus this property for system two, then it means that this uh, property X is an extensive property. You can calculate this property over system one, then calculate this property over system two, then take the sum of system one and system two, and that's going to give you the property of the total system. On the other hand, um, an example of um, what would be an, an intensive property is if the, the total system, the property for the total system is equal to the property of the system one and which is also equal to the property of the system two. So in that case, that would be uh, an intensive property. So the thermodynamical properties in general can be either extensive 
or intensive. So what are some uh, examples of this? So, for example, if you take um, the, the, the volume of a given system, you can write indeed that the total volume of system 1 and 2 is equal to the volume of system 1 plus the volume of system 2. The volume is, um, uh, in that sense, an extensive property. Uh, if you can divide your system into different subsystems, then the, the, the volume of the total system will be the sum of the individual volume of each of the subsystems. So it's definitely an, in, an extensive property. Uh, on the other hand, uh, an example of intensive property would be the pressure. Why? Because if your system is at equilibrium, then the pressure in the system 1 will be equal to the pressure in system 2, which will also be equal to the pressure of the total system. So in this case, the pressure satisfies the condition to be an intensive property. Other examples, so the temperature would also be uh, an intensive property. If the system is at equilibrium, then the temperature of system 1 is equal to the temperature of system 2. Uh, on the other hand, the number of atoms would be an extensive property. The total number of atoms is equal to the number of atoms in system 1 plus the number of atoms in system 2. And another example is the energy. Uh, the energy, the total energy will be equal to the energy of system 1 plus the energy of system 2. One thing that is important to realize is that in general, uh, certain it's not possible to control all the extensive properties and all the intensive properties of a given system at the same time. So for example, um, if you try to think about what are all the possible extensive properties and what are all the possible intensive properties of a given system, some of them are mutually exclusive in the sense that you cannot fix both at the same time. You can control one and in that case it will fix uh, the other as a result, but you cannot control, you cannot force the system to have both uh, certain extensive properties and certain extens intensive properties at the same time. So for example, if you take the, the volume of um, a given system, the volume is an extensive property. If you take the volume, then you force the volume to be too small the system will then undergo some compression. You force the volume to be too large, then the system will be under tension. If you fix the volume just right, then the, the system will be uh, under no tension and no compression. But the point is that if you fix the volume, then necessarily the, the pressure will be fixed. If you try to elongate a material that doesn't want to be elongated, it will develop some pressure. The more you try to increase its volume, the more it will uh, uh, undergo some uh, tensile pressure. The more you try to compress it, the more you decrease its volume, the more you will uh, undergo some uh, compressive pressure. So the pressure is completely determined by the, the volume that you are um, imposing. On the other hand, you could choose to impose a given pressure but in this case, it would be the opposite. If you impose a given pressure, the volume of the system is going to change and you cannot f fix at the same time the pressure and the volume of the system. If you fix a given pressure, then the volume will be determined by the pressure that you want to impose. One way to see that is to say that um, for a perfect gas, uh, PV is equal to uh, NKT, which means that if the temperature is content, constant, then this NKT is going to be a constant. It means that if um, the product PV is equal to a constant, it means that if you are increasing the pressure, then the volume is going to decrease, or if you are increasing the volume, then necessarily the pressure is going to decrease. So if you are fixing the, 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 the pressure, then the volume is going to be equal to this constant divided by the pressure or if you are fixing the volume then it's going to be the other way around the the pressure will be determined by the value of the volume so you cannot fix at the same time the pressure and the volume if the, the temperature is fixed the volume is completely determined by the pressure the pressure is completely determined by the volume so you cannot fix those two things at the same time it's the same if you look at the energy. Uh, the energy is uh, an extensive property. 
and you cannot fix at the same time the energy and the temperature of the system. If you fix the energy, then the temperature is going to be fixed. Uh, but if you fix the temperature, then the energy is going to be fixed. For example, think about uh, a system where you would have um, a chemical reaction going on. So for example, if you uh, fix the energy of the system, so you take a system, you isolate it from the rest of the universe, so it cannot lose or it cannot gain any kind of energy. And then you have uh, different uh, atoms here that are going to react, to respect, re react with each other in a chemical way, form some bonds, etc. So in that case, you would have a, potentially a chemical reaction. This chemical reaction will generate some, uh, some energy, but because the energy of the system is fixed, it means that uh, either um, the, the, the temperature will increase or potentially the, the temperature will decrease depending on whether it's an exothermic or endothermic uh, chemical reaction. In this case, since the, um, the energy is fixed, then it's going to dictate how much does the, the temperature increase or decrease due to this chemical reaction. On the other hand, if the temperature was fixed, if this system was in contact with a thermostat, then it would be the, the energy of the system that would be fixed. So you cannot fix at the same time the energy or the temperature. You have to choose whether your system is going to be at fixed energy, that is to say it's fully isolated from the rest of the universe, cannot receive, cannot give any energy, or if the temperature is in contact with a thermostat, then uh, the, temp the, the temperature is fixed, and, but the energy can vary. The, energy, the system can receive some energy from the thermostat or can give some energy to the thermostat. But in any case, you cannot fix those two things at the same time. And uh, the last thing is that uh, the number of atoms is the last extensive property that we haven't talked about. The corresponding uh, intensive property that corresponds to the, um, the, the, the number of atoms is the chemical potential. Again, if you fix the number of atoms, you cannot fix the chemical potential. Uh, the number of atoms will, uh, will dictate how, what should be the value of the chemical potential. Uh, and on the other hand, if you fix the chemical potential, then the number of atoms can vary and will be dictated by the chemical potential that you are imposing. But you cannot fix at the same time the number of atoms and the chemical potential. So it's important to realize this because when you are simulating a system, you need to uh, decide in which ensemble uh, you are working. The ensemble tells you what are the constraints that you are imposing, what are the conditions that you are fixing. For example, you, you might want to say, I'm going to fix the number of atoms, I'm going to fix the volume of the system, and I'm going to fix the energy of the system. That would be the NVE assemble, that is to say the, the micro-canonical assemble. In this case, what you... Um, micro-canonical, sorry. So here, uh, in this case, what you are going to say is that I'm going to impose the fact that the number of atoms is fixed and cannot change. I'm going to impose the fact that the volume is fixed and cannot change. So it means that the pressure potentially can change. And I'm going to fix the fact that the energy is fixed and cannot change, but potentially the temperature can change. So this is the, the micro-canonical assemble. That's the first choice. Uh, on the other hand, you can also say I'm going to this time fix the number of atoms of the system. So that would be N. And I'm still going to fix the volume of the system. So I'm going to, to fix the shape, uh, at least the volume of the system. And in that case, the, the pressure will be an outcome and not a condition that I'm uh, imposing. But this time, I'm going to assume that it's not the energy, but the temperature that is fixed. For example, if you, are, if you have a system that is in contact with a thermostat, then its, its temperature cannot change. The temperature is fixed by the thermostat. And in this case, uh, you may have uh, a system for which, uh, which can lose or gain some energy, but um, will be at a constant temperature. In this case, this example uh, would be uh, the NVT assemble. It means that you are fixing the number of atoms, you are fixing the volume, you are fixing the temperature. Uh, this one is called the canonical assemble. 
So an example of uh, microcanonical, the microcanonical ensemble is when you have a system that is uh, fully isolated. So it's a system that cannot uh, exchange any energy or cannot receive any energy with the rest of the universe. Uh, an example of a canonical ensemble is when you have a system that has a fixed volume, so the volume cannot change. Uh, it also has a fixed number of atoms, but it is in contact with um, a thermostat, for example, uh, a large collection of uh, liquid, like a big uh, amount of water or uh, a big atmosphere, which is fixing the, the temperature so that the system necessarily will remain at this temperature T0. And if this system um, was to become too hot, uh, it would lose some energy that would be given to the thermostat. If the system was too cold, then the thermostat will provide some energy to the system so that its temperature cannot change. Its temperature will remain equal to the temperature of the thermostats. That would be an example of NVT uh, assemble, the canonical assemble, where the temperature cannot change. It's fixed by the thermostat, but in this case, the energy can change. And uh, last example would be to say, uh, this time I'm going to fix the, um, the number of, uh, of atoms. I'm going this time to fix the pressure. I'm going to assume that the volume can change but the, the pressure is fixed, is imposed by a barostat, and that the temperature is fixed. So in this case, you would have the NPT assemble, number of atoms, pressure, and temperature are fixed. That would be uh, uh, called the isobaric, uh, isothermal assemble. So you have a fixed pressure, isobaric, and a fixed temperature, isothermal assemble. So in this case, um, this types of uh, assemble is uh, typically the one that is uh, relevant to uh, the, the, the atmosphere that, that we know in the sense that if you have a given object uh, on Earth, usually uh, its temperature is fixed. It's equal to the temperature of the rest of the atmosphere and its pressure is also fixed. It's uh, equal to, again, the, the pressure that is imposed by, by the atmosphere, uh, which is equal to, to one Pascal. So that would be uh, uh, some conditions that are uh, relevant to um, systems that are exposed to the atmosphere. Finally, uh, a last possible example is this time you can say, I'm going to fix the chemical potential and I'm going to, to fix, for example, the, the volume and the temperature and say that in this case, the number of atoms can move. So that would be, in this case, the mu uh, mu VT assemble. So mu for chemical potential, the chemical potential is fixed, the volume is fixed, the temperature is fixed. That would be uh, called uh, the grand canonical uh, assemble. And in this case, that would be an example where it's not the number of atoms that is fixed, but it's the, the chemical potential. So, uh, for example, an example for this would be if you have uh, a given system like this, which contains some, uh, some water, for example, and if it's connected to a larger reservoir of um, water that also contains, for example, some, uh, some salts, so uh, sodium chloride. And here, if um, the, the salt is free to uh, diffuse uh, through this, uh, this membrane here, then if you wait long enough, then the salt in this reservoir will uh, diffuse through this system here. So if you take this system here, the number of atoms is not fixed because the, um, the salt will, uh, can diffuse, can enter this system. Um, the, the volume of this system is fixed. The temperature is fixed if, if it's in contact with a the thermostat. And since it's not the, 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 the number of atoms that is fixed, in this case, it's the, the chemical potential. Why? Because uh, the, the, the salt will diffuse through uh, this system until the chemical potential of this system becomes equal to the chemical potential of the reservoir of water. So you will have a diffusion of salt until uh, the, the chemical potential becomes equal 
to the chemical potential of this big amount of salty water that you have here, it means that in this case, it's the chemical potential that is fixed, not the number of atoms. So that would be an example of mu vt assemble, the grand canonical assemble, where the number of atoms can vary, but it's the chemical potential that, that is fixed. So in any case, what you need to remember is that every time you are simulating a, a given system, you need to decide in which ensemble you want to conduct this simulation. Is it going to be in the NVE ensemble, the microcanonical ensemble? In this case, it means that the, you are fixing the energy, but the temperature can vary. Or is it the temperature that is fixed, but the energy that can vary? In that case, that would be the canonical ensemble. Is the pressure uh, fixed, but the volume can vary? That would be the isothermal isobaric ensemble. Or uh, can the number of atoms change? And is it, in this case, the chemical potential that is fixed? In that case, you should work in the grand canonical ensemble. So it's important to choose what is the right ensemble to simulate your system, because the, the way you calculate the average of the thermodynamical properties of your system will depend based on the ensemble that you are choosing. The, the average energy of a system, for example, or the average temperature will not be the same in the canonical or in the microcanonical ensemble. So what we are going to see in the following is how to calculate the average of a given property, the average of the temperature, the average of the pressure, the average of the volume, etc. And this value of the average depends on the thermodynamical ensemble that you are working on. For example, if you are in the NVE ensemble, the microcanonical um, uh, ensemble, then uh, the average of a given property would be typically quite easy to, um, to calculate. That's what we are going to see in the next slide. But on the other hand, and that's the other example that we are going to take, if now it's the temperature that is fixed and not the energy, so it means that now you are in the canonical ensemble, then in that case, uh, the, the average value of the thermodynamical properties of your system will be calculated in a different way. So you need to make sure you know in which ensemble your system is in order to conduct the right uh, calculation to calculate its average thermodynamical properties. So let's first focus on the microcanonical ensemble. So in this case, the number of atoms is fixed, the volume is fixed, and the energy is fixed. But even in this configuration, when uh, the, the energy, number of atoms, and volume is fixed, the system can still occupy a different configuration. You can have different states for this system. For example, if you take uh, a system of atoms like this, where you have a given number of atoms, and this system is in the NVE ensemble, so it's fully isolated from the rest of the universe, um, the, the energy is completely fixed, the number of atoms is completely fixed, the volume is completely fixed, the atoms can still move, okay? The, the temperature is not zero, so the atoms can still move around. And if the atoms can move, it means that the system can have different configuration. You can have uh, the same system that has the same number of atoms, the same volume, and the same energy. Uh, the system is still isolated, but the atoms would have moved around and would be at uh, another position that still gives you the same energy. So if you want to calculate the, the pressure of the system, what you will want is to calculate not just the pressure for one configuration, but the pressure for all the possible configurations that this system can have. So for this, you need to rely on some average. You need to look at all the possible configuration that the system can have. Uh, so you can have uh, configuration number one, the atoms are at a given position. Configuration number two, the atoms are at another position and configuration number three, the atoms are uh, or configuration number n, uh, where you can have um, a lot more configuration in between where the atoms are at a given other position. So in all those configurations, necessarily they all have exactly the, the same energy. The energy is fixed, so it, it has to be exactly the same energy for all the system but the atoms can be at different position, which will give you exactly the same energy. So in this case, if you want to calculate the, um, the average, let's say the average temperature of the system, for example, you will need to look at what is the temperature in the system one, what is the temperature in system two, 
and what is the temperature in system N, and you need to you will need to do some averaging. So for this, you need to know what is the, the relative probability of all those systems. So when you are working in the microcanonical ensemble, it's very easy because by definition of the microcanonical ensemble, all those configurations have exactly the same energy. And if they have the same energy, then there is no configuration that is more probable than the other. They all have exactly the same probability. There is no configuration that is more stable or less stable. They are all have exactly the same energy. And in that case, it means that all those configurations have the same probability. There is no configuration that is more probable than the other. They are all exactly the same probability. So in that case, it means that uh, if you have um, n possible configuration, n possible state, n possible position for the atoms that gives you the same number of atoms, the same volume, and the same energy, then um, the probability of the probability of each um, configuration is they are all the same and since the sum of all the probability has to be equal to one you have n different configuration the probability of each of those configuration has to be equal to one over n so that the sum uh, of all the probability is equal to one so it means that the probability of this configuration is going to be equal to one over n the probability of this configuration number two is also one over n probability of this configuration n is also 1 over n. They all have the same probability because they have the same energy. So in that case, it's, it's very simple because it means that if you want to calculate now the average temperature of the system, all you have to do is to take the sum of all the temperature of all the systems. And because uh, they all have the same probability, you can just take the sum of temperature of system 1 plus the temperature of system 2 etc plus the temperature of system n and then divide by the total number of possible configuration and you will get the the average temperature so in that case the since the probability is uh, they are all the same you don't have to do any kind of weighted average you just take the the average directly by summing uh, this pr the value of this property for all those systems and divide it by the number of systems that you have. So in general, if you want to, if you have a given uh, property B, whatever it is, it can be the temperature, it can be the pressure, etc. In general, the general formula in this case is that if you want to calculate the average of this probability B, you will do the sum on all the possible configuration of uh, this the value that this property b has for all the possible configuration that all have the same energy and then you divide by the number the total number of possible configuration which is going to give you the average uh, value of this property b which again b can be the pressure can be the temperature or can be something else so now what happens if you are not in the microcanonical ensemble anymore, but in the canonical ensemble? That is to say, this time you are in the NVT ensemble. That's not the it's not the, the energy that is fixed, it's the temperature that is fixed. So in this case, again, the, the system, despite the fact that the number of atoms is fixed, despite the fact that the volume is fixed, and despite the fact that the temperature is fixed, the atoms can still move, which means that in that case, the system can have different possible configuration. In that case, uh, the energy is not fixed. The energy can change, but it's the, the temperature that is fixed. But nevertheless, uh, the atoms can be at a given position, or uh, you can have uh, the atoms be at another position, or etc. the atoms be uh, at another position those are different configuration that will give you the same number of atoms, the same volume and the same temperature. So in this case, for example, let's write this as configuration number one, configuration number two, and configuration number n, where n is uh, the number of configurations. So obviously you have a very high number of possible configuration. So in this case, uh, the temperature is fixed, but the energy can change. So in this case, each uh, uh, system can have a different energy, energy E1, energy E2, energy En, 
but this time the temperature is the property that is fixed. So in this case, it turns out that when you are in the canonical ensemble, uh, and if you want to calculate the average of properties, the, the probability of those different configurations is not the same. Why? Because now each of those configurations has a different energy, and if the energy is different, then the probability will not be the same because some of those systems are going to be more stable than others. If their energy is lower, they will have a higher probability. And if the energy is uh, higher, so the, the system is less stable, more unstable, then the probability is going to go down. So in this case, the probability is not going to be the same for all the possible configuration that you can have. They all have the same temperature and same number of atoms and same volume, but because the energy is not the same, the probability will not be the same. So in this case, the probability of uh, each configuration, this is something that is given by the, the Maxwell relationship. So the probability of a given configuration alpha, so alpha can be equal to 1, 2, 3, etc., up to n. The probability of a given configuration uh, based on the, the Maxwell relationship is going to be proportional to exponential of minus the ratio of the energy of this configuration alpha divided by kt, where k is the, the Boltzmann constant and uh, t is the temperature. So what does it mean? It means that in this case, the, um, the property can depend uh, on the energy of the system. Even though the temperature is fixed, the base on the energy, the, the configuration will have a given probability. So if you look at what this um, probability look like, so for example, I can plot the probability of a given configuration alpha as a function of the energy that this configuration alpha has. So if you fix the temperature, then the probability is just proportional to uh, an exponential decay function, where the probability is pretty high when the energy is pretty low, and then the probability becomes lower and lower as the, the temperature increases. So if the temperature is fixed, it means that in this case, uh, at uh, low energy, if the energy is very low, so it means that um, the, the energy he, uh, E alpha is pretty low, in that case, the probability will be pretty high. The system is pretty stable, its energy is pretty low, so it will have a high probability to be in this configuration. On the other hand, if you are at high energy, then uh, the system is more unstable, less stable. In that case, the probability is going to be very low because, um, again, the system is, has a pretty low energy, so the, the, the probability that uh, this system will be at this position, the probability that those atoms will be in this position is pretty low, the energy is pretty low, so it means that the probability will also be pretty low. So now what happens if you decrease the temperature? So the temperature is fixed, but if you change the temperature, if you change the temperature, the probability will also change. So now in this case, if you decrease the temperature, then um, the, the probability uh, will become uh, lower and lower for a given energy. If you decrease the temperature, uh, then uh, the ratio of the energy divided by this temperature is going to increase, so you will take uh, exponential of minus something that becomes higher, so the, the exponential uh, decay function will become lower. So now uh, this uh, black curve here was for a given temperature, so now if you replot what would be the new probability as a function of the same energy E alpha as a function of the temperature, for a lower temperature now the probability will be lower and will look like this. This is what you would get if the, the, the temperature is uh, now lower than the, the initial temperature. So in that case, it means that if you decrease the temperature, uh, it will become more and more difficult for the system to access those configurations that are associated with high energy. It means that the, the lower the temperature, the more you will favor uh, low energy configuration. And 
to the point that if you really decrease the temperature up to zero, then the only thing that will be possible if you keep decreasing the temperature to, uh, to a very low value, if you only decrease the temperature up to zero, then the only possible configuration would be the configuration that has the, the lowest possible energy. Only the most stable configuration would be possible if uh, the temperature becomes equal to zero. On the other hand, now if you uh, try to increase the temperature, so now you increase the temperature, so you uh, divide Ea by a larger number, so uh, this ratio Ea divided by Kt becomes closer to zero, so it means that the probability in that case will increase for a given energy, so if you increase the temperature, the probability that your system uh, can have uh, this energy becomes higher and higher, the probability is now increasing. It means that now the higher the temperature, the more the system will be able to access high energy states. The probability that your system is at high energy becomes uh, non-zero, it becomes higher. It means that in this case, the, the system has a higher probability to be at not only at low energy, but also can be at high energy. And in this case, if uh, you had uh, an infinite temperature, if the temperature was infinite, if the temperature was very high, then the ratio of the energy divided by Kt would always be equal to zero. And in that case, the probability would, would just be the same. And the, the probability would be the same for whatever the, the energy of the system. So your system would be uh, able to have any energy it wants with the same probability. And in that case, uh, the, the, the high energy state of this system would have exactly the same probability as the low energy state of uh, this system. And uh, the, the energy would not be a relevant parameter anymore. So now it means that since each uh, of those configurations has uh, a given probability, um, the, um, the way that you can calculate this probability is as follows. So you know that based on the Maxwell relationship, the probability is proportional to exponential minus Ea divided by Kt, but we know that the sum of the probability has to be equal to 1. So um, what is the sum of, the prob of, of all those probabilities? So um, to, uh, for the sum of all those probabilities to be equal to 1, it means that you need to take each of those probabilities. Uh, so we know that those probabilities for a given configuration alpha is proportional to this term, exponential uh, minus energy divided by kt. And if you want to make sure that once you sum this probability on all the, the configuration alpha, it's going to be equal to 1, then you need to divide this probability by the sum of all those terms. So you need to do the sum for all the configuration from alpha going from 1 to n of exponential minus e alpha divided by kt. Or just to differentiate, I'm going to write this one alpha prime to make sure uh, we understand that it's not the same as this alpha. So in that case, if um, you sum those probability p alpha for all the, the configuration alpha, then necessarily by definition, this probability will be equal to one because the sum of all those terms that are on top of this fraction will necessarily become equal to this term here at the bottom of this fraction. So this the sum of all the probability, if you sum for all the probability, for all the configuration going from alpha equal one to n, of all the probability, it will be equal to 1, which is what we expect for uh, a probability. Their sum should be equal to 1. In this case, we have this quantity here, uh, which is the sum uh, of all the probability um, for alpha equal 1 to n. This, uh, this quantity, which uh, is the normalization factor that we need to add um, for uh, to calculate the um, the, the probability of a given system alpha, this is what we are going to call uh, z, which is the, the partition function. So this is called uh, the partition function. And in this case, this partition function is very important because if you want to calculate the probability of a given configuration alpha, what you need to do first is to know its energy. So you need to calculate exponential, uh, its energy divided by kt, 
and then to divide by its partition function, this term z, which is the sum of all those exponential minus energy divided by kt. You need to know this partition function if you want to be able to calculate the probability of a given configuration alpha. So now, based on this, how do you calculate the average value of properties? So as a reminder here, we are still in the NVT assemble, that is to say the canonical assemble. We said that in this case, uh, the system can have different configuration. In, th in this case, the temperature is fixed, but the energy doesn't have to be fixed. In this case, it means that different configuration can have different energy. And since different configuration have different energy, then it means that those configuration will not have the same probability uh, than the others. Some will be more probable than others. So we just saw that in this case, the probability of a given configuration alpha, that is to say, for a given set of position for the atoms, uh, for a given uh, series of position for the atoms, the probability that the system can be in this configuration, assuming it has the right number of atoms, the right volume and the right temperature, the probability that, that the atoms are at a given position is equal to exponential minus the energy of this system divided by kT divided by the partition function. This is what is giving us the, the probability for the atoms to be at a given position. It depends on what is the, uh, the energy uh, of this system where the atoms are at this position. Then if we want to calculate now if we have a given uh, property B, so in the case of the, the microcanonical ensemble, it was pretty easy. All we have to do is to take the sum of the value of B for all the, the given configuration and sum them all and divide by the number of configuration. Now it's a little bit more complicated because all the configuration do not have the same probability. So now if you want to calculate the average of the property B, you will need to do uh, a weighted average where you need to put more weight to the probabilities that have a higher probability uh, and put less weight to the configuration that have a lower probability. So the way you would do that is that if you have, again, uh, configuration one, configuration two, and uh, configuration n, where in each case the atoms are at a different position, now you cannot just, you, you will need to calculate what is the value of B for system one, value of B for system two, value of B for system N. In this case, the, the temperature is fixed for all those systems, but the energy will not be the same. The energy will change uh, for each configuration, which means that for each system, you will get a given probability. So now if you want to calculate the average value of B, you will have to take um, the value of B for system one, multiply it by its probability, then take the value of B for system two, multiply it by its probability, etc. Take the value of B for the configuration N, multiply it by the probability of this configuration, and then divide by the, the sum of the, the probability but the sum of the probability necessarily this is something that is going to be equal to one which means that in this case uh, the, the the average value of b is just going to be equal to uh, the sum for all the configuration alpha between from n, one to n times so the value of the the property b for the configuration alpha times the probability of this configuration alpha. So if we want to, uh, to summarize this thing, if we replace P by its expression, it means that if you want to calculate uh, the average value of a property B, whether this property is the energy, is the, the pressure, etc., what you have to do is to calculate the, the sum for all the configuration that are accessible to the system of the value of this property alpha, uh, the, the, this property B for the configuration alpha, multiply by the, the, the probability that the system can indeed be in this uh, configuration alpha, and then divide by the partition function. So this term here is the, the probability 
that the system uh, for the system to be in uh, configuration alpha and that's what you need to know if you want to calculate the average value of p so here the main difficulty is that in this case if you want to calculate the average value of b there is two difficulty first you need to calculate the value of b for all the possible probabilities the all the possible configuration uh, from 1 to n which can be potentially a lot of configuration and you also need to calculate this partition function where this partition function here is the sum uh, from alpha equal 1 to n of all the exponential so this is also um, a property that is pretty hard to calculate because you, again you need to calculate for all the configuration alpha you need to calculate uh, their energy to be able to calculate the, the partition function of the system. So usually the problem is that you don't have a fixed uh, denumerable, you don't have a, a discrete number of possible configuration for the system. For example, if you have a, a given system like this, uh, if you have two possible positions, one and two for the atom, you can always find um, a, a third position three between those two positions for this atom, which means that there is an infinite, necessarily an infinite number of positions for the for atoms because the atoms can move in a continuous fashion. Uh, they are not moving on a grid or on a given lattice, so you can always find, uh, however close two position might be, you can always find the third position in between, which means that you have necessarily an infinite number of possible composition of possible configuration. In that case, nevertheless, it doesn't change uh, anything. When you want to calculate the probability of a given system, it's still given by this formula, where it's the, the exponential of the energy divided by kT, divided by the partition function. This doesn't change. But this time, uh, the partition function, instead of calculating uh, when you have a discrete system, the partition function can be just be calculated by summing on all the configuration alpha going from 1 to n, the value of this um, exponential minus E alpha divided by kT. In that case, if you have now a continuous system where you have an infinite number of possible positions for the atoms, you cannot do a discrete summation. You will need to do uh, a continuous summation. So you will need to calculate the integral. So in this case, nevertheless, it's exactly the same. Instead of doing the uh, discrete summation, you will do an integral of the same quantity, exponential minus energy divided by kT. But this time you will integrate, you will do the integral over all the position of the atoms, which can uh, continuously change uh, in a continuous fashion, which doesn't have uh, discrete values. So in this case, this dr to the power n means that you are doing the integral over all the position. Um, uh, one a position of atom two position etc up to the position of atom n so you are going to do this integral by moving all those atoms one by one so that you can try all the possible uh, position of all the atoms for each set of position you will calculate the energy and then calculate this exponential of the ratio of the energy divided by kbt and calculate this integral to calculate the uh, partition function of a uh, uh, continuous system. So then the idea is still the same, is that if you want to calculate the average value of a given energy, for example, this is here the average value of the, the potential energy, what you need to do is to try all the possible values uh, of the position of the atoms every time you have uh, a given position of the atom, so position of atom 1, position of atom 2, etc., position of atom n. So for each configuration, uh, for each position of the atoms, you will need to calculate the energy of this configuration. Um, so that's the, the value that you want to calculate. You multiply this by the, the, the probability. Uh, here the probability is given by the ratio of the, the ratio of the energy divided by kBT divided by the, the partition function. And you integrate this over all the, the position of the atoms. So you sum 
over all the, um, the position for the n atoms, you do a summation over all the possible position of the atoms that gives you this temperature. And at the end, if you sum this, so you sum all the possible values of the energy, you multiply by the given weight uh, that depends on the probability that the atoms are indeed located at this position, and it will give you uh, the average value of this property, the average value of the energy in this case. So if you want to calculate the average of this property in the, the NVT assemble, so we are in the, the, the canonical assemble at constant temperature, then um, from a mathematical viewpoint to calculate the average value of this thing, what you have to do is to solve uh, this integral. Uh, which in spirit is very similar to the, the very first integral that we saw at the beginning of this, uh, of this video. Uh, you can use the, the Monte Carlo method for this. So here the reason why the Monte Carlo method is very uh, useful is that this, this um, um, function can be very uh, challenging to integrate directly. Why? Because first, if we look at the number of dimensions of this integral, you are integrating over the n position of the atoms. Each position has three components x, y, z. So altogether, this uh, integral is a free n dimensional integral. So there is a lot of dimension. So it's it's uh, quite complex. And in this case, uh, we don't know uh, a priori what are the, the energy of all the position of the atoms. In this case, it's not as simple as just integrating ln of x. We don't have an analytical formula that tells us, like, uh, based on where, where the atoms are, what will be the, the energy. So in this case, it's more complicated. You have to try all those configurations one by one and get the, the corresponding energy uh, to be able to calculate, um, for example, the, this probability term that gives you the, the probability of the, the system to, be, to have this particular configuration and also to be able to calculate the, the, the partition function. So in this case, um, it's much more challenging because of the high dimensionality of the integral and because of the fact that uh, we don't know what is the we don't know what are all the possible configuration for the atoms, and we don't know what is the corresponding energy. But uh, one thing that we know is that uh, a lot of those configurations will not contribute so much to this uh, integral. Why? Because uh, if you have a configuration that has the right number of atoms, the right volume, and the right temperature, but if this configuration is very unlikely, very unstable, if it has a high energy, then this term here, this probability, will go to zero, which means that when you are, doming, when you are doing this uh, integral here, you are summing some terms that are very close to zero and then don't contribute so much to this integral. So uh, this comes from the point, again, that if you plot the, the probability of a given configuration as a function of the energy of this configuration. This is an exponential function. It goes to zero um, as soon as the, um, the energy becomes uh, high as a function uh, with respect to kT. So for all, uh, if you take all the possible configuration of the atoms, most of those configurations will be unlikely. For example, if you take a given volume like this, so you can have a configuration that is like this. That's a very likely configuration. The atoms are not overlapping or anything like this. But most of the configuration, uh, for example, you can have something like this, where the atoms are very close with each other or maybe overlap with each other. In that case, the energy will be uh, pretty high. And if the energy is pretty high, then the probability of this configuration will be pretty low. So when you will be summing all those uh, configuration and calculating the corresponding probability, the probability will be so low that it will not contribute so much to the integral. So in that case, it would be a waste of time just to calculate all the possible configuration. We want to focus only on those configurations that, that have a non-zero probability to exist, that, do not, uh, that are not associated with energy that are so high 
that they are most likely uh, impossible to, um, to, to be accessible by the system and they have a very low priority. We want to focus on those configurations that have a low energy so that they have a, a decent non-zero probability. And this is what uh, the Monte Carlo algorithm is going to do, is to explore all those possible configurations that have uh, a non-zero probability and to uh, be able, in that sense, to be able to calculate for each configuration, for each of those uh, configurations that are likely, that are not unreasonable, to calculate the corresponding energy, which allows you to calculate this term, which then in turn um, allows you to calculate the average of uh, thermodynamical properties for the system by just summing and doing this integral over not all the, the probability, or not all the configuration, but only the configuration that have uh, a non-zero probability, so those conversions that are not too unlikely. Okay, so now we are going to see more about the, the Micropolis algorithm, which is the, uh, the algorithm that is used in practice to explore all those uh, configurations of uh, the atoms that uh, give you uh, a low energy so that the probability is, uh, is high enough and will contribute to this integral. So again, the problem is as follows. We want to be able to calculate this integral that gives us the average value of a given thermodynamical properties. Here in this case, this is the, 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 the average of the, the energy itself, but we could apply this formula for any given property B. In this case, we have to do the summation over all the possible configuration, over all the, um, the position of the atoms, calculate the value of B for all those positions, in that case, for each configuration, calculate the energy. Based on this, you get the, the, the probability of um, this configuration, and then you divide by the, the partition function in order to get the, the, the average of the, the value B over all those configurations that are based on their probabilities. So in theory, this is something that you can do with the Monte Carlo algorithm because the Monte Carlo algorithm can be uh, used to calculate the value of the integral. So we could do exactly in the same way that we did to calculate the integral of logarithm of x between 1 and 4. We just um, uh, generate some random numbers and we check whether they are inside or not of this integral. And based on this, we can calculate the value of the integral. The main problem is that if we directly try to apply the Monte Carlo method to directly solve this integral, there is still one term that we don't know, which is the, the partition function. So here, this term, which is the, the partition function, this uh, term here, uh, z is equal to um, the integral over all the possible configuration of exponential minus uh, the energy for all the possible uh, position of the atoms divided by, uh, by kt as integrated over all the, the position of the n atoms. This partition function is very challenging to, to calculate because we have to know all, what are all the possible configuration of the atoms and what is the, the corresponding energy over, of all the position of the atoms. So in this case, the, we, don't, we won't be able to calculate the value of this partition function very easily because we cannot, uh, if we were able to access all the possible configuration of the atoms, then we, we could directly calculate the value of the average, calculate the value of uh, a given thermodynamical properties for all those configurations, and we would not need the Monte Carlo algorithm for this. So in this case, if we are unable to calculate this partition function, uh, what we can use is to use this Metropolis algorithm, which is a, a smarter way to calculate uh, the average values of uh, thermodynamical properties by exploring the different configuration of the system while uh, avoiding to calculate the, the partition function. So this is based on the idea that uh, if you calculate uh, for a given configuration alpha, you can calculate the, the probability um, of being in this configuration alpha. So this probability is given by exponential minus uh, uh, the ratio of uh, the energy of the configuration alpha divided by kt 
divided by the, the partition function. The partition function is a, is a constant. Uh, it's just a sum of all those exponential over all the, um, the configuration. So this doesn't change. Now, if you have, let's assume you have now a new configuration beta where it's still um, the, the same volume, the same temperature, the same number of atoms, but now the atoms are at a different position. So uh, now you get a new probability for this new configuration beta. It's given by uh, the energy of this new configuration beta. So you have a, a new probability. The partition function doesn't change, but because the energy is different, because the atoms are not at the same position, then the, the probability is going to change. So we don't know what is the probability of alpha and what is the, the probability of configuration beta because we don't know the value of this partition function. But what we can very easily calculate is what is the, the relative property, probability. We can calculate the relative probability. We can calculate how much more probable or less probable configuration B is with respect to configuration alpha. So in practice, what we can do is to calculate what is the ratio of the, um, the probability of uh, configuration alpha uh, with respect to the probability of, partic of uh, configuration alpha. So if we calculate the ratio of the probability of configuration beta with respect to the, um, the probability of conversion alpha, in that case, we get uh, so the, the probability of um, configuration beta, which is exponential minus uh, the energy of this conversion divided by kT divided by the, the partition function times um, the inverse of the probability of configuration alpha, which is the, the partition function divided by exponential minus the energy of configuration alpha divided by kT. And the main interest of doing that is that if you look at the relative probability of conversion, configuration beta with respect to conversion alpha, now the, the partition function disappears. So you end up with um, a ratio which is just equal to the exponential of the energy of configuration beta divided by kT divided by exponential, the sum term, but now for configuration alpha. And what, as you can see here, in this case, you don't even need to know the energy of alpha and the energy of beta. All you need to know is the difference of energy because this ratio is just equal to exponential minus the difference of energy divided by kT, where the difference of energy is just the energy of um, uh, configuration beta minus the energy of configuration alpha. So in this case, you don't know what is the probability of configuration beta. You don't know what is the probability of configuration alpha because we don't know the value of this partition function here. But we know that on a relative basis, the relative probability of beta with respect to the relative probability of uh, conversion alpha is just given by the difference of energy between configuration beta and configuration alpha. And that's the main key uh, ingredient of the Metropolis algorithm. We don't need to know the, the partition function. We don't need to know the probability of each configuration. All we need to do is the relative probability between configuration. So let's say if you start from one configuration, which is your reference configuration, you move to a new configuration. You don't know what is the probability of the initial and final configuration, but you can know whether your new configuration is more likely, more probable, or less probable than your initial configuration. You know the relative probability. You don't know the details of the initial and final probability of those initial and final configuration but you can know which one of those two configurations is the most stable and how much more stable or how much less stable is the final configuration with respect to the initial configuration. And this is the key of the Metropolis algorithm. This is going to be the key ingredient that will allow you to explore different configurations by adopting the Metropolis algorithm uh, within a Monte Carlo simulation. 
So that's the main idea of the Metropolis algorithm. It will allow you to explore all the configuration of a given system at a given temperature and focus only on the one that are likely, the one that have a high probability. The way it works is that you will start from an initial configuration. You will try to move slightly the atoms to change the configuration. Based on this, you don't know what was the probability of the initial and of the new configuration. But all you know is whether the new configuration is more likely or less likely than the, the, the initial configuration. And the way the, the Metropolis algorithm is set up, and uh, this is what we are going to see in the following slides, is that it will allow you to explore those configurations with exactly the right probability that is given by uh, the, the NVT assemble. So the, the probability uh, that is um, given by the, the Metropolis algorithm to explore different configuration will be exactly the same one as the one that is uh, that a real system would have in the, the, the canonical uh, assemble, which, um, as a reminder, the probability the, that, as we know, the probability of a given configuration is proportional to exponential minus the energy um, divided by kT. And the, the main interest of this Metropolis algorithm is that it's going to sample different configuration with exactly the right probability that is uh, compatible this, with this probability given by the NVT assemble. So the, the, the way uh, it works is that when you apply this Metropolis algorithm, the system will explore a given number of configuration. The assemble of all those configurations, this is what we call a, a trajectory. This is an ensemble of different configurations that are uh, explored by the, this Metropolis algorithm. Uh, the probability of exploring those different uh, configurations within the trajectory is going to be given by uh, the, the probability given by the, the canonical assemble, the probability that a real system would have in the canonical assemble. And uh, then, once you have this trajectory, you will be able, based on this trajectory, to calculate the average value of certain properties by calculating the average value, uh, the, the value of a certain property over all those configurations. Uh, and based on the probability of each of those configurations, you will be able to, to back calculate what is the, 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 the average value of the, the property that you are interested in. And here, the, the main idea of the Metropolis algorithm is, again, because we don't know the partition function, we will just rely not on absolute probability, uh, but on relative probability. So again, we, we don't know this term here. So we don't know um, this term uh, that we have called uh, Z before, the, the partition function. So um, in this case, we, we don't know what is the probability of configuration beta. We don't know what is the probability of configuration alpha, but we can calculate the relative probability, which only depends on the difference of energy. So what we are going to do based on this is we don't know the individual probability of each configuration, but we know if we start from one configuration and if we move to another one, is this new one more likely, more probable, less likely, less probable? And if so, how much more likely or how much less likely it is? So the main idea of the Metropolis algorithm is to first start by a random configuration. So you will uh, have the atoms be at a given position, uh, some random position, and then you will start moving the atoms. So you will start to do a, a trial move where you move randomly uh, the atoms so that uh, the system now uh, reaches a new configuration. And based on this, you can now, uh, based on the new energy of this new configuration, determine whether this new configuration was indeed uh, likely or not, what is its probability uh, with respect to the, the initial configuration that you had. And based on this, you will decide whether this configuration is likely or not. Does it deserve to be explored or not? Should it be added to the trajectory or should it be neglected? This will depend on uh, how much likely or how much unlikely 
this new configuration is with respect to the initial configuration that you were starting from. And that's going to be the, the main idea of the Metropolis algorithm. So to better understand the, the main idea of this Metropolis algorithm, the way we can do this is to try to, to, to make a schematic representation of what the, the system will be doing uh, during this uh, Metropolis search. So for example, what we can do is to, to look at what is the energy landscape of this system. So to plot the, um, the energy of this system as a function of all its possible um, configuration. So here, uh, this x-axis symbolizes all the possible configuration. So it's something that is very difficult to, to represent in practice because each atom can have a free direction according to which it can move and you have n atoms so you have three times n uh, dimension for your system but i'm just going to represent it by one axis here which is the the configuration of your system and uh, we can plot the, the energy of your system according to this configuration so uh, what you will do uh, based on the metropolis algorithm is to start by um, an initial position for your system, which for example can be this one. So you start by uh, a given initial um, configuration for a given uh, position of the atoms and you will uh, get its corresponding energy. And then you will start moving the atoms randomly to uh, try to explore a new configuration. So depending on how you move the atom, it's possible that uh, you will end up with a new configuration that is uh, less stable or potentially you could uh, end up with a new configuration that is now more stable. So then after this, there is two possible or maybe three possible scenarios. If uh, you move to a configuration that is more stable, then it means that in this case, you will always accept this move. In this case, it's a favorable move because you are decreasing the energy of the system. It means that the new configuration is more likely than the old configuration. So you will just accept this move. You will go to this new configuration. And after that, you will try to change the configuration again. On the other hand, if uh, you, uh, you tried to move the atoms and you went to a new configuration that turns out to now have um, uh, a higher energy, then you, um, you end up with a configuration that turns out to be less stable than your initial configuration. So in this case, you end up with a, a new configuration that is less stable. In this case, you need to decide whether you are going to accept this move or not, because uh, this new configuration is less likely so it's you should not always accept this move because otherwise you are going to 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 spend most of the time accessing configuration that are very unlikely with a very high energy and as such a very low probability so uh, but on the other hand you know that your system at a given temperature has a given probability to go explore this um, this this configuration so what you will do in this case is that you know that there is a certain probability that your system will indeed go to this new configuration despite the fact that it has a higher energy there is a non-zero probability that your system will go there and this probability is given by the the maxwell distribution so in this case if uh, you make a move, you go to a new configuration that turns out to have a higher energy, you will accept it, but with a given probability. You will accept it with a given probability, uh, which probability will be given by based on the, the Maxwell distribution. So exactly the same probability that would be given by the, um, the, the, that a real system in an NVT ensemble would have. So again, if uh, the energy is decreasing, then you will necessarily always accept this move because you are moving towards a new configuration that is more likely than your old configuration. But if uh, you are moving towards a configuration that has a higher energy, then you will either accept it or refuse it. And you will accept it uh, or refuse it based on a given probability. That is to say the probability that is given by the, the Maxwell distribution. 
So then, well, after that, what you will do is, is to, uh, to repeat this thing. So you will do one first step. So in this case, you will um, accept the configuration. Then you do another step. So you will move the atoms again. So you will uh, access a new configuration. In this case, the, um, the new configuration is uh, now a higher energy. So you have a given priority to either accept it or refuse it. So uh, let's assume that in this case you would accept it. So you, you will now make uh, a new move. It's possible that you will go back there or it's possible that you will go in this direction here too. So in this case, you would end up with uh, a low energy. So you would uh, accept this move. So you could um, do another move. Maybe it's, you will go there. In that case, that would also be a lower energy. Then you make another move. It's possible you go there, you accept or you refuse. In that case, uh, the energy is increasing. So it's possible it's going to get refused. So you would uh, go back here, you would do another move, etc. So here, as you can see, if you do this uh, long enough, you will um, explore um, different configuration uh, for the system. And the main idea of this Metropolis algorithm is two things. First, because you um, always have a small probability that you will accept every move, you will be able to explore different configuration. Even though those configurations have a high energy, you will still have a low probability to go explore this configuration. And the second thing is because of the way this Metropolis algorithm is built because it always follow the Maxwell distribution but that is to say the probability that a real system would have in the canonical ensemble NVT you will still nevertheless spend most of the time on those um, uh, configuration that has the that are the most likely because they they correspond to um, a lower energy so those conversion that has a low energy that those are the one that will have the highest probability and the, the Metropolis algorithm will spend most of the time uh, to explore those configurations that has the, um, the lowest energy because whenever you do a move, if it decreases the energy, you will always accept it. So you have more chance that you will go towards the low energy rather than to, to go towards the, the highest energy. But nevertheless, because you are always accepting the move with a given probability, it means that uh, unless, um, unlike the, the conjugate gradient method or the, um, the steepest descent method that we saw, you don't, you don't have a big risk to be stuck in a local minimum because you always have a probability to exit uh, this minimum and to go explore some other minimum uh, around it. So the main interest of this Metropolis algorithm uh, for, for the Monte Carlo algorithm is that you are going to explore different configuration and uh, you won't get stuck into local minima. You will be able to escape those local minima because you always have a probability to accept a move even if it's increasing the energy. This is something that you would not have in the, the traditional energy minimization method because if you are just, um, uh, for example, uh, starting uh, from here and if you just run a steepest descent, it's just going to, to, to be stuck here and will remain stuck in this local minimum of energy and then you will not be able to escape this local minimum of energy unlike the, the Metropolis implementation of the, the Monte Carlo simulation. So in detail, how should you choose the, the right probability to accept or refuse moves as you are moving the atoms and are, as you are exploring the energy landscape? So for this, again, you will just follow exactly the probability that are given to you by the, the canonical ensemble. So again, we don't know uh, what's the probability of um, a given configuration alpha or beta because we don't know the value of this partition function. But what we know is the relative probability, the probability of uh, configuration beta as a function of the probability of the, the configuration alpha. This only depends on the, the, the difference of energy, the, the difference of energy between the configuration beta and the configuration alpha. So what you will do based on this Metropolis algorithm is to start making some move. You will start moving the atoms, calculate the new energy, compare it to the initial energy, 
and then based on this you will either ref uh, accept or refuse me with this move you will accept the new configuration and add it to your trajectory and then later on use it to calculate the average value of the given property that you are interested in or you would just refuse it and just ignore this new configuration and go back to your previous configuration so for this you need to decide what is the probability of accepting or refusing um, a new configuration and this is just given by this uh, conditional um, probability formula here so the idea is as follows you calculate the energy difference between the new configuration and the old configuration if uh, this energy difference is lower than zero it means that the new energy is lower than the former energy in this case it means that the new energy that you found is more stable this new configuration is more stable so it has a higher probability so in this case you will always accept the probability you will accept to move to the new probability why because this ratio is larger than one it means that the the new configuration has a higher probability than the configuration that you are coming from so in this case you will always accept it because you are going to go towards a lower energy configuration that has a higher probability than the one that you are coming from on the other hand if the the difference of energy is higher than zero so now it means that you are moving towards uh, a less likely configuration so you you if this is the energy landscape um, uh, when the energy is going down so you are making a move like this you will accept this is the case that we just talked about on the other hand if you are going to do a move like this and the energy is actually increasing you will potentially accept the move but only with a given probability and this probability is given exactly by the the ratio between the probability of the new configuration beta uh, with respect to uh, the probability of the former configuration alpha so this ratio here is what is given to you by um, the 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 probability in the nvt assemble so this is exactly the probability that you are going to use to decide whether you are going to go to the the new configuration b or stay at the configuration alpha so in this case you will either accept this move and go to beta uh, or just stay in uh, configuration alpha with uh, in a random way and with a probability of accepting or refusing this new configuration that is given by the the ratio of those maxwell distributions and because uh, this metropolis algorithm is following exactly those properties that are um, those probabilities that are given by the maxwell um, uh, distribution at the end the, the metropolis algorithm will sample all those um, configuration in a way that is exactly uh, the same as the the one that a real system would have if it was indeed in the nvt assemble and uh, where each configuration can be more likely than the other based on its energy and where the configuration that are associated with lower energy are more likely with a higher probability than those configuration that has higher energy so in practice this is how what it looks so here uh, this plot shows the the probability of uh, acceptance or the probability of accepting this new move as a function of this thing which is the the ratio of the the difference of energy divided by kt so as a reminder the the difference of energy is equal to to the new energy minus the the old energy so it's the um, the difference between the new energy after your move minus the the old energy if this new energy is lower then the the difference will be uh, lower than zero uh, in that case you will always accept the move if uh, this uh, difference of energy is positive then the new energy is higher than the new one the system becomes less stable in that case you will potentially accept the new move but only with um, a given probability 
So we say that the probability is given by this term, which is exponential uh, minus the difference of energy divided by kT. And the way it works is that in this case, um, uh, what you will do is accept this new configuration, but only with this certain probability of acceptance that is given by this number. So what you will do for this is that uh, you, what you will do is to generate um, a given random number. So you will generate a given random number that is uh, between uh, 0 and 1. And then you will compare this uh, random number with respect to this probability that you have here. So depending on how, what is the, uh, the, the, the difference of energy and depending, by the, um, depending on the temperature. So you will have, for example, uh, a given, uh, for a given difference of energy, you will be at this given position. You generate now a random number that can go anywhere between 0 and 1. If the random number is in this domain, that is to say, if the random number is lower than your uh, probability of acceptance, then uh, you will uh, accept the move. But if the random number that you just generated is higher than this probability, then you will reject the move. So this makes sense because it means that if the probability of acceptance is very low, for example, if you are, if you, um, if you are, um, if you, you make a move so that um, the, the difference of energy is very high, you move to a new configuration that is very unstable with a low energy. In that case, um, it means that delta E becomes very large. It means that in this case, the probability of acceptance exponential minus delta E uh, over kT will be very low. In that case, when you generate your random numbers, you have a much higher probability of refusing, of rejecting the move rather than accepting the move. So in this case, uh, because the probability of acceptance is very low, uh, then the probability that you will indeed accept this configuration, the probability that your random numbers will indeed be lower than this threshold is very low. On the other hand, if you are just making a move that is only increasing a little bit the energy, for example, let's assume you have a, an energy landscape like this, you are um, uh, at this position here, you are making a move like this, it's only slightly increasing the energy. So uh, delta E in this case will be very small. So in this case, the probability of acceptance will be pretty large. So you will generate your random number between 0 and 1. In that case, the probability that you will indeed generate a random number that is lower than this threshold, it's pretty high. So you have a pretty high uh, probability of accepting. Your probability of acceptance of the new configuration is pretty high if you are making a move that is only slightly increasing the, the, the energy. But if you are making a move that is uh, really increasing a lot the energy like this, then it's very likely that uh, because the energy is increasing so much, the probability of acceptance is going to be uh, pretty low. Just keep in mind that this also depends on the temperature. The temperature here is fixed because you are in the NVT assemble. But if uh, you are now uh, working with a different temperature, the probability of acceptance is going to change. If um, the you increase the probability, if you increase the temperature, then the probability of acceptance will always increase. So the probability of acceptance. Uh, if you increase the temperature, is going to increase like this. This is if um, the temperature is increasing. If the temperature is increasing, you will have more chance to uh, accept moves even though they are uh, increasing the energy. So for example, if you start here, uh, you make a move like this that is increasing the energy quite a bit. If you are at, uh, if the temperature is very low, then the probability of accepting such uh, a move that is increasing the energy so much will be very low. But if you are now working with a higher temperature, then the probability of acceptance becomes much higher. So if you are at low temperature, you will mostly favor the move that brings you to lower temperature. 
but if you have lower energy, if you have a, if you are working at low temperature, you will mostly favor the move that brings you towards low energy configuration. But on the other hand, if you have uh, a temperature that is um, that is higher, you will favor more those moves that brings you towards higher energy. You will have more freedom to explore configuration, even though they are associated to higher energy. So this priority of acceptance also depends on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the more you will accept moves in general, even though they increase the temperature a lot. And the more you decrease the temperature, the more you decrease the temperature, the more you will refuse all those moves that increase the energy too much. And the more you will favor uh, those moves that either increase the energy just a little bit or even better decrease the energy. So um, depending on the temperature, the, the ratio of those moves that either increase the energy uh, or decrease the energy that you are accepting or refusing will change. And this comes from the fact that, again, uh, a real system in the NVT assemble will have a higher probability of accessing high energy configuration if the temperature is lower and if the temperature is low, uh, sorry, if the temperature is higher, the energy will have a, the, the system will have a higher probability of accessing high energy configuration. But if the temperature is lower, then the, the system will have a much lower probability of accessing those high energy states and will only uh, remain mostly stuck into the, the low energy configuration. So now let's see in practice what will be the, uh, the algorithm to implement uh, a Metropolis Monte Carlo simulation. So again, our goal in this case is to simulate uh, for a system of atoms uh, to be able to calculate the average of certain thermodynamical properties, for example, the average of the, the energy or the average of the pressure. Uh, in the NVT assemble. So we are still uh, in the NVT assemble in this case. So in this case, uh, what you will do is initially to start with uh, a given initialization, just like in most of the algorithm, you will need to initialize some um, um, initial parameters. So for example, in this case, you will start by saying that, okay, I'm going to start by configuration number zero. That's going to be your reference configuration. And in this case, uh, just remember that you need to start by the atoms being somewhere. You cannot just um, start from the atoms being nowhere. You need to start by a given configuration, a given set of position for the atoms. So you need to decide randomly for all the atoms uh, from i equal 1 to n, you need to decide where the atoms are, and that's going to be your uh, configuration at uh, this initial step, uh, alpha equals 0. That's going to be your initial reference configuration from which you are going to start to move, and based on this configuration, you will get an initial um, energy, which is the energy at the step alpha, where initially alpha is equal to zero. So then, starting from this um, initialization, where you have an initial configuration, what you will be doing is you will be doing a move. So what does it mean to do a move? It means that either you will move one atom, or maybe you will move several atoms, uh, so this uh, will depend on the detailed implementation of the, the kind of move that you want to try, and we will talk more about this um, in a few slides, but what you are going to do is to move some atoms. Uh, you are going to, uh, if this is your energy landscape, you are going to start from there and do one move in a random fashion. You are going to move randomly, in, uh, in one way or the other, but you are going to take those atoms and move them in a random way to access now uh, a new configuration. So based on this, uh, after you have moved the atoms, you can now calculate the, the new energy after, um, after the, the, the new position of the atoms at the new step alpha plus one, the new configuration. You have a new energy because the atoms have moved. So now you can calculate the, um, the, the difference 
of energy, which is the, the, the new energy at the step alpha plus 1 minus the new energy. So now you calculate the, the difference of energy, which is going to tell you whether you are going to accept or refuse this move. So then this, the first step that you have to do after this is to check is this difference of energy zero. If uh, the energy is decreasing, that is to say if the, the difference of energy is lower than zero, then you know that the new configuration is uh, more um, uh, stable. So now you have moved towards a new configuration that is more stable. So in that case, you will always accept this new configuration. So if this energy is lower than zero, then you will just accept this thing, uh, go back to the, um, to the to, to accept this new configuration. So you will now uh, increment the, the number of the configuration. So you move to the next configuration, you accept this new configuration, you take it as your new reference, and you will start moving another atom. If, uh, if uh, the difference of energy is actually not negative, that is to say, if you are moving in the other direction, if you are moving in a way that is actually increasing the energy, then in that case, you will need to either accept or refuse this uh, new configuration, but only with a certain probability. So in this case, you will uh, first generate um, a random number uh, epsilon, so that epsilon is um, in between 0 and, uh, and 1. So you will generate this random number. And this random number will allow you to decide whether you will indeed accept or refuse this new configuration that you just created. So after you have uh, generated this uh, new uh, random number between uh, 0 and 1, what you will need to do is to check whether this uh, number epsilon is lower than your probability of acceptance. As a reminder, the probability of acceptance is minus uh, exponential of minus the difference of energy divided by kT. So if this uh, random number is lower than this probability of acceptance, then you will um, accept the move again, so this time uh, you will uh, accept the move because the, the probability of acceptance was apparently high enough that your random number was lower than this probability of acceptance, so you will accept the move. Again, you will now uh, take this new configuration as your new reference configuration and you will um, restart from there and make a new random move to uh, explore a new configuration. If you um, turn out that you are refusing this move. So in that case, you generate this random number. The random number turns out to be larger than the probability of acceptance. In that case, you are going to, to refuse the move. So in this case here, if you are either following this branch here, you are accepting uh, the new move. If you are following this branch, you are also accepting the new move. But in this case, if you are following this branch, it means that you are refusing the move. So in this case, um, the probability of acceptance was too low. Your random number was not low enough. Your random number turns out to be larger than the probability of acceptance. So now you will uh, refuse the move. So what does it mean to refuse the move? It means that you will uh, go back to the, the previous configuration. So your new energy uh, at step alpha plus 1 will uh, go back to the energy that you had at the step alpha. And you will uh, move back the atoms to their initial uh, position alpha. So you will move back to the original configuration alpha. And this old configuration, in that case, will remain the new configuration. So you will still keep this new configuration alpha and uh, try another move. But in this case, it's important that you are still counting this configuration alpha two times. You were at a given configuration alpha. You tried 
to move uh, out of this configuration. This move was refused. In that case, you are going to try, you are going to count this configuration alpha two times uh, because the fact that uh, this move to escape this configuration alpha was review, were ref, was refused tells you that configuration alpha is actually a pretty likely configuration. So in this case, you need to count it two times. You cannot just disregard it. It needs to be counted two times. So in this case, if you are on this branch, it means that you have been uh, refusing this, this move. So then you will do this, uh, this cycle a given number of times until uh, you have done uh, enough uh, Monte Carlo cycles so that you think that you have sampled enough your energy landscape and that you, uh, you can stop and have a decent estimation of um, all the possible uh, configuration that have an the, a probability that is not too low so that you can use this to calculate the average values of the thermodynamical properties of your system, like uh, the average energy, the average pressure, etc. So just to put this into words, this is what the uh, algorithm would look like. You start, you initialize with a given initial configuration at uh, step one or step zero with an initial energy. You make uh, a trial move, which in the case of atoms would be just to, to move one or several atoms. After you move the atoms, you go now to a new configuration, I plus one. You can calculate its new energy and you can calculate based on this the difference of energy. If the difference of energy is zero, it means that the new energy is lower than the former energy, so the system is more stable. In this case, you will accept the move and uh, the new configuration is added to the trajectory. So you will take this new configuration into account when you calculate the average value of, uh, the, conf of the, the properties. If the energy is actually increasing, so you are going towards a less stable configuration, in this case, you will only accept it, but only with a given probability. So you will uh, generate a random number R that can go between uh, zero and one. And if this number turns out to be lower than your probability of acceptance, which is given by exponential minus the difference of energy divided by KT, then you will accept the move. Otherwise, you will reject. If the move is in, in accepted, then the new configuration I plus one becomes the new configuration for the ne next step. So you will restart from this new configuration. But if the move is refused, then you will disregard this new configuration I plus one and you will um, you will uh, go back to the new configuration I and configuration I will now become the new configuration I plus one. So you will count two times this configuration I. So one thing that is important to keep in mind again is that whether you accept or refuse the, mu the move, you will always generate a new configuration. So you will always have a new configuration. Either it's going to be the new configuration or it's still going to be the same one that is just counted two times. And the fact of counting two times this configuration, if it turns out that the move was refused, is very important to get an accurate uh, evaluation of the, the average of the, the, the thermodynamical properties. So then at the end, uh, what you have after this is that you have generated a trajectory. If you have done enough Monte Carlo moves, you have explored now uh, a large number of configuration. The probability of each of those configuration to be sampled is exactly the one that is given by the, the, the NVT assemble, so the canonical assemble. So you have your trajectory. It contains some uh, configuration. The configuration that are the most likely will come back the most often. Uh, their uh, priority of coming back is the same as the one that is given by the, the Maxwell distribution. So then all you have to do is that you will calculate for all the configuration in this trajectory, you will calculate the value of the, the property B that you are trying to calculate the average of. And since already now all those configuration that belongs to the trajectory already have the right probability, 
all you have to do is to sum the values of b for each of those configuration alpha within this trajectory just sum them all and divide by the number of um, uh, configuration that you have and in that case there is no need to add any kind of weighted average you can just directly take the sum of all the the b values for all the configuration and divide by the number of configuration why there is no need for any weighted average in this case because uh, all the configuration that you are doing the sum on they already have exactly the the right probability that is given by um, the, the the maxwell distribution so there is no need to add any uh, new weight to this if a priority is more likely it will just come back more often in the trajectory so that you can directly take directly the sum without needing to add any kind of weight so to understand why it's important to count two times uh, configuration when you are refusing moves uh, in order to calculate the average values of um, the, the given thermodynamical properties of a system. Uh, to illustrate this point what we can do is to, ta to take a, a two-state model. So a two-state model is uh, a model where the system can take only two possible states, um, one with a high energy state one with a low energy state so uh, here in this case e1 will be the state that has a, a low energy and e2 is another possible state that has a, a higher energy so there is a lot of uh, system in nature that uh, can be well approximated by a, a two-state system um, uh, for example if you take um, uh, a compass a compass can either point in the direction of the north that's what is going to uh, decrease its energy that's the most stable configuration but it could also potentially point towards the direction of the south that would come with a, a higher energy cost but that's theoretically possible so that would be in this case a, a, a two-state system where the compass either points towards the north or towards the south but the, the fact that the compass is pointing towards the north is much more probable because it comes with a, a lower energy. So in this case, uh, we, we can calculate directly uh, what is the probability of each state because it's a very simple problem. So in this case, the, the probability, we can calculate the, the, the partition function. The partition function in this case is going to be the sum of exponential um, minus e1 divided by kt plus exponential minus e2 divided by kt in this case there is only two states so it's possible to easily calculate the partition function and in that case it's easy to calculate the probability of state 2 it's uh, exponential minus the energy of state 2 divided by kt divided by the partition function and uh, the probability of state 1 is the, um, the exponential minus e1 divided by kt divided by the partition function so in this case because e1 is lower than e2 because the state one has a lower energy than e2 then necessarily the probability to be in state one will be larger than the probability of being in state two and this comes from the fact that here in this expression the energy e1 is lower so exponential of minus e1 is going to be lower than uh, the, the, the is going to be larger than the, the, the exponential of minus e2. So the probability of p1 is going to be larger than the probability of p2 in this case because the energy of the state one is lower, so it's more stable than the, the system uh, in uh, state two. So now let's assume that you want to calculate those probabilities and you want to calculate the let's say the average energy um, based on the, um, the Monte Carlo algorithm so if you want to calculate uh, in this case the, the average energy it's you don't necessarily need a Monte Carlo algorithm because we could just calculate it directly in this case there is only two states so you can say the average energy is uh, the energy in state one times the probability of state one plus the energy of state two 
times the probability in state two, so that that's fine. You can uh, you can do that, but in this case um, you will find that because um, state one is more likely than state two, you have a higher chance to be in state one than in state two. So it means that in this case, the the average energy will be somewhere between state one and state two, somewhere between the energy of state one and somewhere between the energy of state two. But because you are more likely to be uh, at state one than at state two, the energy will be closer from uh, E1 than it is from E2. So now if you want to simulate this with a Monte Carlo algorithm, so you will do the, the metropolis. Uh, exploration. So you will start by uh, a given reference, which in this case uh, you will start being in um, in step uh, in the uh, uh, configuration number one. St um, uh, you will uh, start to be in a state number one, and then after that you will try to move. In this case here, it's a two-state model, so there is only one type of move that you can do. If you are in state one you can move to state 2, and if you are in state 2, you can move to state 1. So in this case, you start from state 1. So you are going to um, start uh, to do a move. In this case, the only move that you can do is to go from 1 to 2. In this case, when you do that, uh, the, the energy would increase because E2 is larger than E1. So you have a given priority to either accept or refuse this move. So in this case, um, it turns out that the first attempts will be refused because you are increasing the energy. So you have only a, a small probability of accepting, so it gets uh, refused. So you stay, in this case, in uh, state 1 again. And again, uh, as I mentioned before, it's important in this case that you will need to, um, from um, going from uh, your... Uh, uh, move number one, now you move to go to move number two, you need to count back again that you are in uh, state number one. So now you try to move again, turns out it's again refused, so you need to stay again uh, for now this uh, step number three, you need to stay in uh, stage number one. You try to move again, again refuse, so you stay again in uh, state number one for uh, step number four. So now you start to, um, again, you try to move. You, the only thing you can move is to move uh, from one to two. That's the only possibilities. Here in this point, turns out that now you accept. Uh, again, you can accept or refuse with a given probability. So it turns out that this time you generated a random number that now makes you accept. So now you are at step number five, now you are in um, uh, state number two. You, are, you have reached the, the second level, the second state, the higher energy state of this system. So now you are in state number two, you will need to do a move. In this case, the only move that you can do is to go back to one. When you do this, necessarily now the energy is, um, is the difference of energy is negative, so you will necessarily accept. In this case, you, you have no choice but to accept. Whenever you are in two, you will always accept to go back to one because this is what decreases the energy. So you need to always accept. So then you try again, turns out it's refused. So you stay in, um, in state, uh, you stay in, uh, in state number one for uh, step six and step seven. Step seven, you try to move again, it turns out it's accepted. So now you go to uh, state two for uh, stage seven. Then necessarily you will need to accept at the next step for step nine. In this case, you refuse, so you stay at one for step 10. In this case, you accept, so you move to two for 11. Then you go back to uh, one for 12, etc. So this would be an example of Monte Carlo algorithm where you have only two states. In this case, you have, uh, whenever you are in state two, you will always accept the fact of going back to state one because you are minimizing the energy. The energy is decreasing. But if you are in state one, 
you have the, pr the, the a given priority to either accept or refuse to go to state two. So here, this is a good example to try to understand how you would now calculate the average energy. So the average energy, in this case, you would just sum the energy that you have over all the, the Monte Carlo move that you have. So now if we just count uh, what we have, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 times we have been in state number 1. So for 10 times we have the energy number 1. And for, um, let's see, for 1, to three for one uh, three times you will have um, the energy in uh, state number two and you divide by the total number of uh, Monte Carlo move that you did which is in this case 13 so that's going to give you a good representation of what is the average energy it's going to be something that is closer uh, to E1 than from E2 and here you see why it's important to keep all the, the configuration even when you are refusing the move because if you did not do that, if when you are here you tried to move to 2 and you refused, here you need to count 1 again and again otherwise if you did not count this, if you just say that this is only uh, one trial and I just count it for once then necessarily you will end up with exactly as many um, uh, cases where you are in state 1 and as many cases as you are in state 2. If you are just um, neglecting those times that you are trying to escape from state 1 and only count all those 1, 2, 3 and 4 uh, configuration as just being one configuration, then you will end up with a, a result that would not be the, the good one. In that case, you would say that the, the average energy is just uh, one times uh, during uh, in state one, a second time here, a third time here, a fourth time here. So you would have a four times E1, and you would have a three times uh, E2. So you would get a number divided by 7 which is not the right number because you are neglecting the fact that if you are in state 1 if you try to escape from state 1 but the move is refused you need to count uh, state 1 twice you need to count it three times four times you need to count it as many times as you are trying to escape from this configuration and that the move is refused. If the move is refused, you need to count this new co this configuration several times because the fact that the system is staying in this configuration and is not escaping from this configuration means that this configuration is more probable, more likely, and then you need to count it more when you calculate the average of the properties. So it's important to keep all the configuration even when they are refused, you still need to count the former configuration several times in order to take that into account. So now if you think about what are the, the strengths and weakness or the drawbacks of the Monte Carlo method, uh, the Metropolis implementation of the Monte Carlo method, um, one good thing is that the Monte Carlo method will allow you to um, explore efficiently all the, the possible configuration of a given system that are uh, that have a, a, a non-zero probability to be accessed at a given temperature. So again, if you think about it, you have an energy landscape like this, and what the Monte Carlo algorithm will allow you to explore all those configuration here. You will spend most of the time exploring those that are uh, the most likely, but you have uh, a chance to go towards higher uh, energy as well. So it means that um, you have potentially a chance to um, climb over high energy barriers to maybe find um, a deeper minimum that you would not have found otherwise. So it's a very efficient way to explore the landscape to either find new configuration that you would not have found by a traditional energy minimization method that tends to get stuck 
into some uh, local minima or to just uh, efficiently sample the energy landscape in order to uh, calculate the average value of thermodynamical properties. Uh, the main drawback of the Monte Carlo method is that uh, you will be moving the atoms in order to um, explore this uh, landscape, but the way the atoms are moving is not necessarily following the way they would move in real life, because you are just moving them randomly uh, with some random motion in random direction, so it doesn't have to follow, the, uh, and it doesn't follow, it will not follow, the real dynamics of the atoms, it's just a fictitious dynamics. So it means that if what you're interested in is to really simulate how the atoms are moving according to time, how are they vibrating, how are they diffusing, what is the, their real direction and uh, dynamics that they have over time, then the Monte Carlo would not work because there is no time in the Monte Carlo simulation. You are just generating new uh, configuration there is no no time so if there is no time you cannot see how the atoms are moving according to time if this is what you want then you will need to run some uh, molecular dynamic simulation which is what we will see uh, in the in the next chapter on the other hand one of the advantage of the monte carlo algorithm uh, with respect to the molecular dynamics method is that it's much more general than the the, the molecular dynamics uh, simulation method in the sense that it, it, it can be applied to a, a wide range of system, it can be applied to just calculate uh, integrals or it can be applied to, to simulate uh, discrete system which are not necessarily made of uh, moving atoms. So in the sense it's a more uh, versatile technique that can be used for a lot of physical problems uh, when you want to simulate the, the dynamics or the, the, the different the, th the thermodynamics of system in um, the NVT assemble, the, the Monte Carlo can usually be um, a, a very good choice, whereas uh, molecular dynamic simulation will only be limited to simulating the, the Newton dynamics of atoms or rigid objects as a function of time, so it's uh, to some extent more restricted to only one targeted application. So now let's finish by saying um, to discussing how in practice you would implement uh, a Monte Carlo simulation for a system of atoms if you want to calculate uh, the average of a thermodynamical properties, for example, the average of the pressure or the average of the energy for a given system at a given temperature. So in this case, the idea would still be the same. You would start by an initial configuration. So it means that you have to decide at, uh, as a reference, you need to pick randomly for all the atoms uh, that belongs to your uh, configuration. So for uh, all the atoms, ranging from i equal 1 to n, you need to pick randomly an initial position, which is going to be the, the position at step 0, and then you are going to start moving the atoms. So um, a very uh, simple algorithm for this is to first select randomly an atom, so you would generate a random number, and based on this random number, select randomly one of those n atoms, and then you need to start moving this atom. So you will need to select randomly a direction and randomly uh, select um, uh, a length of this jump. And this is going to become your, your new configuration with this single atom being moved in a random direction and uh, over a random uh, length. And then Based on this new configuration, you will recalculate the energy, calculate the difference of energy, and then use the, the Metropolis algorithm to decide whether you want to accept or refuse this move. So in practice, this is how, uh, how it would work. You start by your initialization, uh, where you create an initial random configuration, which is going to be your, your reference energy as well. You pick randomly one atom i among all the n atoms and uh, you uh, you take its position and you move it to a new position by applying a random displacement you calculate the new energy the difference between the new energy and the old energy gives you delta u the difference of energy then based on the Montepolis algorithm 
you will either accept or refuse the move. So if delta U is negative, then the new energy is lower than the old energy, so then you will accept the move. If delta U is positive, then you will accept the move, but only with a given probability of acceptance. This probability of acceptance is still the same. It's still uh, exponential minus delta U over KT. So for this, you will again generate a random number, compare this random number to this uh, probability of acceptance and either refuse or accept the move. If uh, the move is accepted, then the new configuration with this new displaced atom becomes the new reference that you will use for the, as a reference for the next um, uh, Metropolis uh, Monte Carlo step. But if the, um, the move is rejected, you will go back to the, the initial configuration. So you will move back the atom to where it was at the previous step, and you will uh, count this new configuration two times and use this as a new reference and try uh, to move another atom in another direction. And you will repeat this uh, enough time to get uh, enough statistical averaging and to, to, to sample as, uh, as well as possible all the, the configuration that are accessible within the energy landscape for the given temperature that you want to, to take into account. So then one question based on this is still how should we uh, move the atoms? So this rely on you uh, moving the atoms. So you need to move the atoms in, uh, in a random way. How should we move uh, those atoms? So here what you need to do is first to select one atom randomly among all the n atoms. You need to select one atom randomly. You don't want any bias in that. You don't want certain atoms to move more than the others. So you need to select uh, one atom randomly with a uniform distribution so that you have the same chance to select uh, all those atoms uh, from 1 to n. And then after that, you need to uh, generate uh, a random move for those atoms. So there is two steps when you generate uh, a random move. First, you will need to select randomly a direction. So when you are in two dimension, there is um, what you need to, to, to fix the, di the direction is to select uh, two angles that will give you in uh, two dimension what is the, the direction of the move. So this is going to give you a vector just in which direction are you going to move this atom. And then you need to select how much are you moving this atom. Are you moving this atom just a little bit or are you going to move this atom a lot? So you need to select randomly the, 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 the length of this move. So typically uh, for this, when you uh, select the, the length uh, over which you are going to move these atoms, you are going to choose randomly this displacement, but you are just going to choose the, um, the minimum displacement and uh, the maximum displacement. And then you are going to, um, to choose randomly a displacement between this uh, displacement that, is, uh, that can be zero uh, at minimum or that can be uh, given uh, delta R max as a maximum. Why? Because uh, it's not useful to move the atom too much. You know that if you move the atom too much, then the new configuration is likely to be very unrealistic. So you will need to choose what is the lower bound and the upper bound of the, the, the kind of move that you want to make. On the other hand, you, you still want to select the, um, the displacement randomly because if you just move all the atoms by always the same distance, then it would be exactly the same as having the atoms on the grid where they can only be at a discrete position. So that would introduce some, some bias that would uh, prevent you from accessing certain configuration. So in that case, you still need to select randomly this displacement, but you can just put a, a lower bound and um, an upper bound for, for this displacement. So then the, the last question is, how should we choose this upper bound for the displacement? Like, how should we choose the maximum displacement? And if you um, select randomly the length of the displacement between zero and delta max, it means that on average, the average displacement will be on the order of uh, 
delta r max divided by 2. So how do you choose this delta r max? How do you choose the, the average displacement of the atoms? So here there is, some, uh, there is no universal answer and uh, it, um, it kind of depends on, uh, on experience. Uh, what you need to understand is that there is a balance between uh, two things. So uh, again, what you are trying to do here is to, you have a given landscape and you want to uh, explore this landscape as efficiently as possible. So if um, there, is, there is two possible things that can go wrong here. If you start by um, initial, initial position like this, and if now you select a very small displacement for the atom, so it means that you are selecting one atom randomly and uh, you are going to move it just a little bit and you are going to move to do some small baby step and only move the atoms only a little bit. If you do this, then it's, it's, um, it's going to be pretty uh, inefficient because you keep uh, moving the atoms only a little bit. So it means that if it turns out that the energy is decreasing it's going to take you a very, very, very long time to reach the, the minimum of energy because you are making only very small step at a time. So you are not changing the configuration so much. And on the other hand, because you're, um, you're, uh, you are making such a small step, it's very unlikely that the energy will, uh, will change so much because if you are making a very small step, the configuration has barely changed. So in this case, the, the, the change in energy is going to be very close to zero because you are just very, very uh, changing very little the configuration. So even if the energy is increasing, the, the increase in energy is so low that when you are calculating the, the probability of acceptance, which is exponential minus delta E over KT, because delta E is so low, the probability of acceptance is always going to be close to one. So you will keep, even if you are going up in energy, you will keep accepting. Uh, so if you are choosing um, delta R max to be too small, the, the main problem in this is that you keep accepting all the move. You keep accepting all the move. And um, the problem with uh, keeping accepting all the moves is that it's not a very efficient way to sample the, the energy landscape. It's going to take you a very long time uh, to explore uh, the entire uh, the range of possible configuration. So it's not a good idea to have delta R too small, mostly because the simulation will not be so efficient. It will just take you uh, a very long time. On the other hand, um, if you choose delta R max being too large, that would also be uh, an issue. Why? Because if you start again from this point, if now you start, so you select one atom and you move it a lot, you move it too much. So it means that you are very likely to move so much that the energy increase a lot and you end up with a, always a, a very unrealistic configuration because you are moving the atom so much that it's very likely it's going to overlap with a, another neighbor. So you will end up with a very unrealistic system with a very high increase in energy. In this case, delta E will be very uh, high because the energy is increasing a lot. So in this case, the prime is exactly the opposite because you are always making a move that is um, too large. In that case, um, the, the, the increase in energy is too high. So you will keep, in this case, refusing uh, all the moves. Uh, and again, it's going to be pretty inefficient because you keep removing all the moves. So you just remain stuck here and uh, you, um, you just waste your time just uh, making some trials that are very unrealistic, so they all uh, remain stuck where they are. So if you think about it, uh, based on this, it means that uh, if you want to find the best possible solution, you need to have a balance between those two things. You need to choose uh, a delta R max that is not too, lo not too large and not too small, so that your simulation is as efficient as possible. 
And in practice, uh, a good trick to, to figure out whether uh, your simulation is properly optimized or not is that you know that if delta r max is too small, then you keep accepting all the moves. You know that if your delta r max is too large, then you keep refusing all the move. So uh, a good way to check if your delta r max is uh, properly optimized is to look at what is the, the, the fraction of moves that are uh, accepted. What, what is the fraction of moves that are accepted? Again, if uh, too many moves are accepted, then it means that most likely your displacement is too small. You could increase it. You are wasting too much time. If um, all the moves are being refused, if the fraction of move being accepted is too low, then it means that your delta R max is likely too large. So um, a good rule of thumb for, for this is to check what is your fraction of move that are accepted. And if it's close to 50%, then it means that probably your delta R max is properly optimized. If it goes too much higher or too much lower than 50%, then probably it needs to be optimized. Okay, so that's it for this uh, lecture. So this is uh, uh, providing you with an introduction to the, the Monte Carlo method, which again is very efficient to explore uh, the energy landscape that is accessible to system and to calculate their uh, thermodynamical properties. So it's useful to take for a given system of atoms and at a given temperature calculate what is going to be its average uh, pressure or its average volume or things like this. Uh, but uh, when it comes to directly predicting the motion of, of the atoms and how the atoms are going to actually be displaced over time, in which direction, how are they going to vibrate, at which frequency, or like, how we are they going to, to, to diffuse over time, what will be uh, the, the viscosity of a given system, how fast are the atoms moving, all those things, for all those things, you need to actually solve the actual real dynamics of the atoms. And this cannot be done with uh, Monte Carlo because there is no time. So this is going to be uh, what we are going to see in the next, quad in the next chapter, which is the, the molecular dynamics method, which can be used to explicitly solve the, the motion of the atoms according to time.